scholars, good to be back with you. And today I'd like to talk about what's happened to when a car goes around a turn and the car has a wing on it. So it's got aerodynamic downforce, okay? So let's imagine we've got a car going around a turn. This is kind of like the last video I did. If you want to go back and check that one out, you can. Boy, there's a terrible turn. Um, and the turn's got a radius, so the turn is a circular arc, okay? And we're going to assume the car tracks down the center of the track. We're going to assume also that the radius of the turn, there's a car right there, okay? The, the radius of the turn is large compared to the dimension of the car, so we're going to treat the car kind of like a point, all right? Okay, we've got a radius there. So here's the deal. Car's going around a turn. Let's just, for, for simplicity, let's assume it's turning to the left. It doesn't have to be. Let me fix that. Let's try that again. Eh, I don't know if that's better or not. Less terrible. How's that? So anyway, let's take a look at what forces are letting the car go through the turn. So maybe look at the car itself, and we'll make a maybe a, a low, wide kind of race car. Um, okay, there. Maybe that's a, there's an old class called Can Am. My one of my favorite Can Am cars was an old one called a Porsche 917. They used to call them Panzer 917s. Here's what one looked like. Okay, so it's got about a squillion horsepower in it, and it's got this great big wing on the back and these big wide tires. There's probably also some aerodynamic downforce from the body of the car. In modern cars, that's, that's also something that happens quite a lot. But for right now, let's just consider the wing on top of it. If you want to uh, blend the body in later, you can. So we've got two forces coming down now. Um, the force down is now not just the weight. It's the weight plus the aerodynamic downforce. So it's weight plus, and we'll just call that FA for aerodynamics. Well, that's M. Let me make this bigger for you. So W is MG plus aerodynamic downforce. Now, what's the expression for aerodynamic downforce? Look in your fluid mechanics book or aerodynamics book, whatever you got. It's coefficient of lift times 1 half rho B whoops, squared squared s, all right? The coefficient of lift, that's a non-dimensional, it's just a number that describes how much lift a wing can make. It has to do with the cross-sectional shape of a wing, the airfoil. This is usually in the range of one or two. One half is just a number. Rho is the density of air. Well, the, the st uh, standard density for air at, you know, ISO conditions, 20 degrees C, 70 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, is uh, 1.23 kilograms per cubic meter. We're going to use 6 over 5. That's 1.2. That's pretty close. Uh, velocity, velocity squared. And S is the, is the uh, area of the wing. Okay, if you look down at the, the wing from the top, that's basically the width times the length. All right? So let's put some numbers on this. Let's make the mass equal 1,000 kilograms. That's a little heavy for a race car, but not too bad. All right, coefficient of lift. Well, these things can be a pretty high lift because you always know exactly what the angle the thing makes with the air. It's not like an airplane where the angle changes. With a car, you only get one angle. And so let's, let's make this 1.5. You can change these numbers later if you don't think these are right. Okay, rho, let's see, make sure I got that in frame. I better stop there. Is uh, 6 over 5, and that's going to be kilograms per meter cubed. Think about that. That means a cube of air that big weighs 1.23 kilograms, so it's like two and a half pounds if you want to do it in English units. That's a lot. That means a cube of air this big weighs about as much as a book. Hmm, okay. All right, and S, let's assume that the cross, the, the area of the wing, I think I decided was, I'm going to check my computer here, is uh, two square meters, okay? So about that wide and about that by that. Okay, that's about right. If you want to play with these numbers later and, and uh, modify them, you can. So what are we trying to find here? Well, we're trying to find the speed through the turn. If you want to find the speed through the turn, we're going to have to use Newton's law. So Newton's law says that the sum of the forces equals ma. Well, let's see, there's a force going that way. That's the friction force. Is there any force that other than that that makes the car turn? Don't think so. I think that's it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with Newton's law and say the sum of the forces equals 
MA. Well, since this is a circle, that's MV squared over R. Now, we're going to need a coordinate system. Now, we know we're turning left. We know we're trying to go that way. So let's make positive x that direction. Okay, if you decide to make positive x this direction, what you're going to find is you're going to get a negative force. Force is going to be in the negative direction, which means your acceleration is going to be in the negative direction. You'll have to add a minus sign in there to get it to work out. It's easier if you do it this way, but physics doesn't care what coordinate system you use, right? I'm sitting here in West Lafayette, Indiana in a little rectangular office, so it's easy to maybe make a, a coordinate system based on the walls here. But, you know, the Earth is round and it's spinning and it's going around the Sun and the Sun is moving through the galaxy and the galaxy is moving through the local cluster. Who knows what the, co the coordinate system ought to be? That's just it. Physics doesn't know anything about our coordinate system. It just works. So the coordinate system is a human uh, concoction, something we've developed to make our math work. So any coordinate system will work if you apply it correctly. This makes it easy. So let's do that. Well, we only have one force. It's mu times n, where that's n. So mu times mg plus cl one half rho v squared s equals mv squared over R. When you don't have aerodynamic force, the mass cancels out. Mass doesn't appear in every term here, so mass does not cancel out. Mass matters. Have you ever seen a race car where the, the driver or the crew chief or the designer goes, you know, if I could just make that car heavier, I'm going to put a sheet of lead under it to make it heavier. It never happens, does it? Well. That's because mass matters. You want this car to be as light as you can get it. Right? And designers go to extreme lengths to make that happen. Well, I'm going to run out of space on my little board here. Um, let's see. Can I erase this stuff over here? Let's see. Let's do that. And I guess we've got that. If you, if you need those numbers, you can, you can scroll backwards and get them. So what we've got to do here is we've got to solve this for velocity. What we're trying to do is find the maximum velocity through that turn. Well, that's the maximum for maximum horizontal force you can generate with the friction from the tires because that's the, you know, it's the down force you've got available to you. So if you want to solve this for V, let's, I'll, let's go through two steps here. There's mu mg plus cl, oops, mu cl one half rho v squared s equals mv squared over r. All right, let's do a little bit of, of uh, algebra here. And you get a square root of, let me make sure I get this right, I'm going to cheat and look at my computer here. Um, mu mg, okay, that's that term right there, um, times mass over radius, which will be a minus sign, and I've got mu c. Well, where'd c come from? To try to keep this clean, what I'm doing here is I'm saying that CL one half rho v squared s. So let's make big C equal CL one half rho s. Okay, so that becomes mu C right there. Well, if you work this out, say 1.5 times one half times six over five kilograms per meter cubed times 2 meters squared, and that turns out to be 1.8, and it's a really funny unit, just the way this works out. Let me double check here. Yeah, it's kilograms per meter. Okay, so that's, that's what goes in there. Well, if you work this out, how far down can I go here? I got this. V turns out to be, uh, let's see, 44.897. meters per second. Well, is that a lot? I don't know. I think. That's, let's try something here. Let's, let's calculate downforce and compare it to the weight of the car. If the downforce adds measurably to the rate of the car, then the uh, uh, speed around the turn is going to be higher, right? Okay, well, let's clear this out here. Okay, so the weight of the car is mg, and that is, let's see, well, it's 981 
newtons. Okay, thousand thousand uh, kilograms times 9.81. Well, what's the aerodynamic downforce? Well, if you work it out, CL one half rho v squared s, you get uh, 3628. Okay. Well, that means the aerodynamic downforce is about a third the weight of the car. Well, that's definitely enough to make a difference. Now, modern race cars are very light. They, the wing area is large. And if you look at Formula One cars, they've just got wings all over the place. See, they look like that. And they also get aerodynamic downforce from the body. So that two meter squared number for area is probably not right. Um, Indian Indy racers can make several times the weight of the car in downforce so that modern Formula One cars and modern open wheel racers in the United States could run upside down. If you could somehow get them upside down and, make, and get them to run on the roof of a, of a tunnel or something, they could. Now, you don't want to miss a shift, but as long as you keep up speed, you really could stick them to the ceiling of a tunnel or something just because of the aerodynamic downforce. So there you got it. F still equals MA, gang. Now, uh, when you want to figure out the shear forces from the tires, now it's mass of the car times the gravity, plus now this aerodynamic force. And mass of the car does not cancel out anymore like it did when that term was zero. So there you are. Hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.